My name is Alexa Mead, and I'm really excited to be part of the conference. I have developed this style of artwork where I paint on people in a way that makes them look like two-dimensional paintings. From every possible angle, you could photograph it, you could do video, and it will give this illusion that the world is just a flat canvas. I was a creative arty kid growing up, but I never thought that I had what it took to become an artist. I like to draw, I like to make friendship bracelets, but there is, doesn't seem to be a really neat even career path to go there. And I found that a lot of my art instructors in school were encouraging of my talent, but encouraging me to find other ways to make a living or develop other passions outside of the arts. I started getting really obsessed with politics growing up in Washington, D.C. I started interning on Capitol Hill for congressmen and senators and got just like totally immersed into that world. And I decided that's what I want to do with my life. I joined all these clubs in high school, like Junior State of America and these really political activism groups. And that was my passion. I got my bachelor's degree in political science from Vassar College, and I decided, okay, I'm really going all in in politics. I worked on the 2008 Obama campaign doing press. I was super inspired for political action. And then something in me changed. I started getting a little disillusioned with the political system, and that coincided with the time where I realized that I really am so passionate and excited about art and creating. And I felt like I hadn't quite found my voice, and I wasn't sure what that was or what it meant, but I knew that there was something in me I really had to explore. During my senior year of college, I took an elective sculpture class, and the professor gave us an assignment. He asked us to make a sculpture of a landscape that wasn't a sculpture of a landscape. It was some paradoxical thing, made no sense, it was completely open-ended. I kept asking him questions like, what does this assignment mean? I don't know how to satisfy this. And the solution that I came up with for this sculpture class homework assignment was to imagine a landscape with shadows on it. And if that landscape existed as just the shadows of the trees, of just these features casting shadows on the earth, absent the features. And from that idea, I thought it would be really interesting to put black paint down on shadows. And it was this concept that I presented to my professor. I was really excited about it. He wasn't interested. So to satisfy the homework assignment, I had to come up with something totally different. I ended up making a house out of cardboard that had a cardboard tree in front of it. It was not nearly as inspired, but it got me the grade that one typically hopes for out of education. But it took that part of myself to really bring out, OK, but I'm really excited about this idea. No one's grading it. There's no due date. But I just want to see it in the world. and so. I just started toying with it, I became obsessed with it, and then I started thinking about what if in addition to painting shadows on the ground, I could paint shadows on people. They're moving, the light could shift around them, and if I painted shadows on them, what would that look like? And so I started doing these experiments um, after hours in the sculpture studio. I wasn't supposed to be in there, but I forced my way in. And I realized that something really weird was happening. When I would try taking a photo of this person covered in paint, it looked like a two-dimensional painting. And that completely caught me off guard. My interest in painting shadows was not about this idea of, I'm going to become a painter. It was this idea of exploring space and interest in sculpture and light and shadow. And I had no idea that it would open up such a huge line of inquiry from me. Um, I later tried showing my sculpture professor what I made in terms of, look at this picture, it looks like a painting. And he was not very impressed. I remember I'd found him in the cafeteria to tell him about it, and he didn't look up from his bowl of chili. And I was trying really hard to show him on my camera, look at this. And um, I knew, OK, well, it's external validation from teachers is important, but I had to find that strength within me to acknowledge that there was something here that excited me and that I was going to push forward through it. I had discovered this technique shortly before graduating from college with my degree in political science. My parents had the expectation that after college I was going to go back home to Washington DC and get a job on Capitol Hill, as I had many summers previously. I still liked 
the Hill. I still liked that kind of former side of myself that was a huge political nerd. But I knew that something that just happened in my brain when I was creating art was something that I couldn't find anywhere else in my world. And I had to further explore that. It was just this open-ended series of questions, things that I had no idea what would come out the other end. And it took me to ask the questions and answer them through experimentation. My mom used to use our basement as her old office, and no one had been down there in years. And so one day, I just packed up all of her things and set up my art studio in there. And it took about a month for my parents to realize what I had done. In the meantime, I'd been telling them that I had been searching for jobs, and I had been. I'd been applying for jobs, but not really with all of my heart into it. It was more to make my parents uh, get off my back about that because they were really terrified of the idea of their child becoming an artist. Um, it took them a long time to be able to accept that this was what I was doing. And I think it really took them seeing how hard I was working at it and that this, I wasn't saying I was an artist as a euphemism for being unemployed. I was actually trying to make it as an artist. I was trying to carve a path somewhere where I had been highly discouraged and I was determined to make it happen. There was something about the sculpture class I took in college that was really liberating. Being given this open-ended assignment that could take any form, any medium, and it could allow your ideas to go into places like that, of putting paint on shadows. And that felt in very stark contrast to any art classes I had taken in elementary, middle, or high school, where it seemed very much like, okay, class, we're now going to be making a painting of a landscape, and uh, we're going to be using these types of paints. And I know a lot of it was about the mastery of mediums and learning these techniques, but there's something about allowing someone to pull from out of them a voice for having them put their view of the world, maybe taking a prompt or a challenge, but then from that allowing their creativity and imagination to grow in a way that otherwise an instructed creative process might not. Or, um, I remember in college when I was taking my sculpture classes and I was thinking, wow, this is so amazing having these weird prompts for assignments that would inspire me to create something. And I remember the teacher telling me that, well, if you want to keep making art after you graduate, you have to learn how to start asking these questions of yourself and set up these prompts, set up these challenges if you want to be able to be diving deep into this type of inquiry. And he said, you know, you could otherwise just be practicing art and making things, but the real art comes in the challenge of having a problem to solve and pulling something out of yourself that you didn't know was there in order to solve it. When the subject matter is people, it's really important that you have something that inspires you. If a painter ordinarily paints on canvas, it seems like it could be a very one-way relationship of the artist projecting their ideas onto what's going to happen on this blank screen. But when you have something as dynamic as a human being, their energy is coming back into you. And it's like this constant push-pull, tugging. It's this dance and the dynamic between these two forces. I might have an idea of how I want to paint someone when I you know, first lay eyes on them, but through the process of painting, everything completely changed. I might start out saying, OK, I want to create this pattern with vibrant colors that really um, feels like it's light and buoyant. And then as I'm getting to know this person through the process of painting them, it's so intimate, I might realize that there could be a deeper sadness in there and something more beautiful to express than what I had initially projected on it. And allowing that process of just listening and allowing the art to come out from me, but to just pour out as well from the subject matter. At the beginning of my process, I'll pick out a model, I'll pick out which props, furniture, clothing, all of the things that will set the scene. And I just, stare at it. It might be in the way that someone will stare at a blank canvas to try to pre-visualize what's going to go on there. It's the same thing when I have a person standing in front of me that I'm about to paint. I just sit there and I stare and I do weird things with my eyes, bringing them in and out of focus to try to really imagine how will this look as a two-dimensional painting. After that period of very awkward <laughs> time that might take longer than <laughs> my model might want, I then start committing brushstroke by brushstroke to turning it into a reality. As I'm painting, I have to go fast, if it, especially if it's on a person, because I have to be sensitive to 
this is my creative artistic endeavor, but this is also somebody who has real needs and maybe they can't sit in that one position forever or maybe they'll want to go to the bathroom or maybe this is just too intense of an experience to prolong any longer than it needs to be. It forces me to work fast. And there's something about that constraint that I find really liberating, that I don't have the opportunity to second guess myself. I can't get overly perfectionistic. I can't overwork things. When it's done, it has to be done. It's not like I can paint the model and then tell her, all right, great work, come back tomorrow and I'll get finished then. I have to finish same day that I start. And that allows for a real intensity to come through in the work too. After I finish painting the entire scene, I will do a whole photo shoot of it. The physical installation is very much a part of the artwork, but it's its end documentation. It's the photographic print, it's the video. That's what endures beyond. There's something so ephemeral about my work that if you don't capture it in that fleeting moment, it's gone forever. And especially when it comes to painting on a person. And it's a huge switch in gears in my brain for me to go from paint mode and moving really fast to all of a sudden feeling this sensitivity with the model as a photographer, trying to bring out certain sides of them. Is I could do a really great job on my part of making the painting, but if the model isn't bringing the life in through the eyes, then it will completely fall flat and in all of the wrong ways. After I take all the photos, and it feels like, okay, we got it. At that point, the model will wash off the paint. I used to not have a shower in my studio, and so the model would have to take an Uber home <laughs> looking like that. <laughs> the cleanup process is a lot easier than you would think. The paint comes off really easily. Typically, I'll paint on top of a wig or something so that their hair is protected, and I'll try to have as little surface area of the skin exposed as possible. So that means I might paint someone wearing long sleeves and long pants and the amount of cleanup involved is just washing your hands and washing your face. One of the things I loved about art class as a kid was the opportunity to just zone out and make something for the class period. One of the things though that I've appreciated about art making after school is the ability to really think deeply about why am I making this? What do I wanna make? What do I wanna say? And then there is that aspect of just creating and zoning out and feeling one with the creative process. But I realized that with maturity and sophistication that the parts that are so satisfying is that moment of recognition of idea, aha, that little snap of dopamine that happens when you all of a sudden put something together for yourself. And that was a feeling that I had never had in any elementary, middle school or high school art class. It felt less about finding answers and more about honing technique and craft and making art for the sake of making art as opposed to finding something within you and pulling it out and not knowing where it's going and really shaping the art that you express through your voice that can't come out of anyone else's voice, not a teacher's, not your friend's, but from something in you that you didn't know you had to say until it's coming out of your mouth and you're saying it. Thanks for having me at the conference. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and stay inspired. <laughs>